do you have the audacity to audition? Because if you do, Reaper's coming for you. Uh oh. There we go. We've got we've got them all in there. This is Podkit, episode sixty-two, Fontkit, on Saturday, November twenty-first, twenty twenty. And now it reminds me of pudding. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersat. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk62. Hey, Podkit. Howdy. Hey. Yeehaw. Yes, it is uh, a month later. I don't know. When, what, I think it's been over a month. I took two weeks to edit the last episode. Sorry about that. Um, to the point where it was so delayed that we talked about Eleven T on that podcast episode, and then Ryan and I went and like completely used Eleven T to the max, and we're like, we could have had a whole other conversation about it before even posting the first episode. Well, we I think this time. is but, actually really good progression because we talked about it, and now we used it. Now we're experts. There you go. Experts in massive quotations, but yes. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> you, no, no, no. You you only use single quotes, so they're pretty small quotations. Yeah, okay, the f- fair, yeah. Prettier, always with single quote, always. I use whatever's default. Um, but yeah, Eleven D was really cool. Uh, we used it. What did we rebuild? JavaScriptMN.com. Yeah, it's, uh, there's, um, you know, it's not a big website. It's not super complicated, but it's pretty uh, pretty good example of using something that isn't Gatsby uh, to do something. So that's good. Uh, what else did we use on that uh, site, Brian? Um, Tailwind two, uh, sorry, Tailwind one, <laughs> Tailwind one. <laughs> I'm reading the notes and you say, and suddenly Tailwind two is out. So we use Tailwind one. Now Tailwind two is out. We'll do some follow up with that, um, in time, but yeah, we, I, I, I'm always scared of using a new thing as soon as it comes out. Uh, for example, I'm still on two Mac OS's before the current version because I'm paranoid. Uh, so we'll, we'll get around to this, um, a little bit. Um, incidentally, I was showing some people at work, uh, the new JavaScript MN website, um, kind of just giving them a little tour of what we changed on it and stuff. And somebody, you know, said like, Hey, you know, I kind of noticed all of the motifs that you put on all of your websites. And I thought, Oh, that's funny. And so we've kind of invented Ryan design here, which is really just Tailwind, but <laughs> it's kind of fun. And your and your great um, flavor for Easter eggs and <laughs> well, that is true. Fun features. Some of the work stuff that I do can't have Easter eggs because it has to be serious or something. <laughs> uh, but but there are always at least one or two. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, what you guys did with the JavaScript amend site was really really cool. So. Nicely done. It has me wanting to rebuild Brian M. Me with eleven T, but and Tailwind. Maybe we'll see. I think in in baby steps. I don't want to redo all of it at once. That's just asking for oh, trouble. Oh, that's what you say. But once you make one component in Tailwind, everything becomes Tailwind. That's the, this is but I, I not too long ago switched to using new CSS and some of my own CSS on top, and it's so much less work than the what did I use UI Kit before. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so it's it's a lot cleaner and a lot more pure now. So um, I do like that new CSS just has all these default styles and then bam, it just is works that like without the word much. new or like with the like N E W or is it with a U and an E and a weird letter? N E W. Okay. Yeah. But it, it's mostly, you know, rules around it has some colors, which I think I've overridden most of because I want my own kind of theme. Um it has some dark theme support. Um I've added a couple of variables on top because I want a little more variety in different colors and things um what's that new uh font on ios from apple san francisco okay is there, is there another font they use on mac os that's not san francisco uh the san francisco pro text there's wow, what a name. san francisco there's a rounded version there's also new york which is their serif typeface i was, I was oh. gonna say they do have a serif one too but i think it's all just very into san francisco I mean, maybe maybe need that on the site too on my site? Yeah, just for fun. So well, I'm it? loading I'm loading inter. Yeah. But um, the system UI font is the fallback. Okay. That's good. What, Brandon? You have thoughts about inter? I do. I don't Let's know if I've it. ever seen it. So I like it because I'm using the like the super duper variable font 
that lets me do the slant. So if on party mode, it it changes, it animates the slant of the typeface. I mean, the font file is like 300k, but on supported devices, that is less bandwidth than if it were loading the italic and the normal. Okay, I found example. it on Google Fonts. Um, I'll tell you a secret about this font. It looks like every other font I've ever seen. Yeah. I might like be at it. that point in my life where I don't care about fonts anymore, which is really terrifying, but also quite relieving. Yeah. I, I do like fonts. I think the thing about Intervit's very odd is that on a couple, like, it seemed to came, come out of nowhere. I remember hearing about it when it was like first launched in like 2016 and being like, oh yeah, that's kind of interesting. And then nothing, 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 nothing. And then all of a sudden I'm like taking over all these projects that use it. And it keeps having these really weird confounding effects on the build pipeline that are really annoying. Um, like I'm, I'm trying to remember what the deal is. Like people should just import it like a f- font. Like like there's no, there's, there's, there, shouldn't, there shouldn't be any drama around it, but it uses like, I'm trying to remember the context for it, which is why I didn't really want to talk about this because I don't actually remember what the problems were. But it's like all of this for a variable font that just looks like Helvetica. I'd rather just use Helvetica. <laughs> yeah. Because Helvetica yeah. is Helvetica. Or Futura is Futura. Like, I see, I see Inter and I see San Francisco. And I like Inter because I'm used to seeing San Francisco everywhere. Yeah. So it's a little different. It's just a subtle, yeah. You don't really notice, but when you call it out and you're like, oh yeah, that's a little bit different. I don't know. I don't see Inter very much. So I was like, oh, this is a nice little stylistic thing um yeah i think uh doesn't doesn't tailwind default to enter is that is that a thing oh really no that can't be possible it defaults uh, to I the think it, os system ui yeah yeah uh, i don't know we'll, we'll google that later uh with duck duck go i'll throw one more thing while we're on font kit a hey. i've been using a um a service called future fonts sometimes future or feature future f future like the wrapper future Okay. Um, F-U-T-U-R-E. Um, and what they do is basically if somebody, somebody like a small font foundry or an individual who's a type designer wants to release a font before it's done, um, you can buy the license for it at a reduced rate. And there are some really fun ones. They're kind of art deco and weird and like 70s kind of vibes. Um, but I was talking with a, um, a kind of a collaborator on some stuff who also bought a font from here and the font that he purchased was also a variable with font. And he's like, I feel like I bought a couple of individual fonts like this, but every time it feels like it looks best in the samples. And whenever I try to use it, it looks terrible. Like it looks like it's taken out of the, out of the context in which it was intended for. And I try to use it in, in kind of as kind of an accent font or even like anything in an application. It just feels weird. It just feels weird. Like it's not quite right. Um, and I've also found this, like I have a font that I have that I really like is called a, uh, framboisier or something like that. I'll throw that in the show notes too. Um, like it's a cool font. I love it. I've only ever used it in slide decks because it looks kind of jazzy and kind of cool. Um, but you can't really use it on its own because it's like a title font almost. Right. And I don't, I don't know enough about typography in order to make any sort of like reasonable statements about it, but like as a as a developer as somebody who picks fonts for websites and things like that sometimes like i'm like oh this looks super cool it's kind of like i don't know it gives me some kind of like mcphail center for music vibes which is probably mostly because of the orange that they use in the samples um and like but then i try to use it in something and i'm like man i need another font in order for this to work Mm -hmm. otherwise it's just gonna it's just gonna be all like angular jazzy kind of stuff and which is great which is what i want but it's not like cohesive so yeah i'd like i'd like to try putting some more like flex so right now like in my site using inter the headings of course are a little more a thicker font weight which is kind of how headings are and that's some nice um they're also larger in size which is why they look extra thick and things but like um that adds some like good contrast in weights and font style but a new a new typeface there would be kind of fun too and then you can get some flair i really liked in the um, slide deck that Ryan started for um, the JSMN talk we gave around Eleven T and Tailwind. the The cursive font. I don't remember yeah. what that one's called. I, I have no idea. I love that. It's just so. It's, it's a little whimsical, a little fun. Yeah, and that's something I would love to add. Maybe not quite that extreme. So more of like a serif or serif ish font, and 
not not fully cursive or super serify classic yeah but um, just a little bit for some headings i think that would be kind of fun but yeah it's, it's hard too because you don't really know what looks good and if you need to buy it then you need to buy it and then you try it out and you're like oh this doesn't work now i need to um find a use for this thing i just spent 50 bucks on and didn't end up using the, the so. thing i will say that to bring it all back around to tailwind is that tailwind helps because it gives you some like predefined scales you can use right Mm -hmm. sizes for things and i feel like the entire character of uh of a typeface can change based on like its relative size which is why if you look at like adobe's um whatever they call it type kit i think type kit there you go um and you know even google fonts and stuff like that they have some kind of predetermined stuff you can do where it's like oh how does this look like if it's if it's structured like a title and then paired with this other font as like it's body text or subhead or something like that yeah and i think that's really interesting and really powerful which is why like honestly it's it's kind of cool to use tailwind that way and as like exploration for such things but i don't know i put into the notes here uh the league of movable type uh, it's yeah. one of the places where I get some of my fonts, specifically the uh, Ryan Ramper said font and the Nexus font. Because, you know, if you use one branding aesthetic in one place, you might as well use it everywhere, right? <laughs> um, something about Ryan design. And um, on this website in the old days, they used to have like a bunch of, you know, fun examples, kind of like the site you shared, um, Brandon, uh, the future fonts. And what I always found is as I tried to use them, other than, of course, League Gothic, they were useless outside of the weird examples that they used to throw together in the old days. Ooh, league script. That's fun. That is, this is a little fun. That is, I, mm. <laughs> gosh, this gets me so excited. I just want to like create some like fun, creative websites, but I don't have the content. I just want to like have fun with, yeah, I need to write more blog posts that are more wordy. The ones that are super technical with lots of examples are just such a pain to write. And my examples are terrible. And then, I did that post this summer about um, CSS stuff and my color scheme for styling it because I tried to make it work in light and dark theme without having to switch out all of those colors. It just looks like crap. I need to just like, I probably just need to embed code pens or something instead, but oh, uh, yeah. I feel yeah. Like, I'm kind of of two minds about this because there's some stuff like that where, like you said, I'm, I'm really excited to go all out, but I don't really have a lot of content. And then there's other things where I have a lot of content, but I don't really have any thoughts about how to present it. Like, all my, like, case study portfolio type stuff is now in a Notion doc because Notion yeah. just makes all those decisions about how to look, how it should look. And then it can live there. And then if I want to make something more specific, then, you know, whatever, I take it out of Notion. I mm-hmm. plop it in some markdown files and, you know, Bob's your uncle. I'm sure there's some kind of... Uh economic analysis that somebody could do or or has done about mm-hmm. how since all of the text we write is all digital like there's no effort to present it but then ironically mm-hmm. people just devour things that are presented so much better right yeah funny how that works no well yeah i mean it reminds me of like pudding um the pudding i think is what it's called i'm trying to remember it, their, i think their website's like pudding.cool or something like that that just does like kind of scrolly telling yeah putting dot cool kind of like scrolly telling kind of analyses of stuff of data right and it's just like you know it's just like you know kind of vox style explainer infographic e type stuff oh it reminds me of the outline yeah i mean it's kind of the same sort of thing i mean if you've if you've looked at 538 in the past month or anything like that like all of these things are kind of you know visualization like that um, so it's, they do, they do really interesting stuff like that. Um, but I think like you said, that's kind of a, like this data has always existed, <laughs> right? Or maybe not has always existed, but this data has always been out there, but nobody's going to consume it unless it's presented in some sort of, like you put, as you put it, interesting way. And the outline's another example like that. Well, and it's sort of a weird thing too, because when I look at some, when I look at the outline, it's like, no, I hate this website. It is just aesthetically awful. Uh, It's just noise. There's so much design noise. Uh, One thing that I've started seeing that I really like is is this new, like, extremely constrained uh, reading viewport, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, like, um, in in Tailwind Pros, I found out that you can do um, 65CH width on, on like, a div or a p-tag. And it's just just wonderful to have a human-centric way to define the, the width of a line. 
Yeah. That CH unit is amazing. It's, I love it. It's so nice. What, what is a CH? It is a character. Oh, right. Okay. And I don't sure, know which sure, sure. character, but, you know, so roughly the idea is to get to that 65 to 70 line width. Which That's is right. I have used this before. Pleasant. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Understood. So it, it represents the width, or more precisely, the advance measure of the glyph zero. Right. Um, so zero, the Unicode character, U plus zero, zero, three, zero in the elements font. So it's a relative to the current font of that, uh, of the zero character. So yeah, it, so if, you know, if you increase the font size, it'll increase, like it, it gets larger with it. It doesn't start wrapping more. So I think it's good for container sizes and things like that. Yeah. I, I really like that. I think I'll start using that on some of my own stuff. Yeah. Oh, I just want to redesign my whole site again. <laughs> do it, do it. I'm going to try to do mine at some point. That's that's the kind of fun weekend task that I spend, like, I start at, like... Five weekends on? Yeah, or I start at, like, three in the afternoon, and I work until three in the morning. And um, and then I come out of it, and I'm like, oh. And then I spend the next day just cleaning up everything. I've, I've never done that before, can you tell? N- never. <laughs> All right, well, um, this was some great talk about 11T Tailwind and fonts. So that that was font kit. Now we're going to talk about Mac kit. Font kit is over. No more fonts. We cannot discuss fonts any longer. Okay. We'll see. We can handle it. So should we talk about Macs now? Yeah, I didn't watch any of the anything, but it sounds like there's some new laptops and a new Mac mini. Yeah, I sure did do watching that event. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. Uh, it I watched done. it as well. Um, yeah, the the designs. Oh, so they released a new uh, MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, 13 inch, the lower end, and Mac Mini. The physical design of these are pretty much the same as before. Um, they all have two Thunderbolt and USB four ports. Um, the MacBook Air has no fan still. Um, now, for the first time, right? MacBook Air used to have a fan. Yes, actually, I think that's true. The 12 inch MacBook never had a fan, but that doesn't exist anymore. So, um, like physically, they all look pretty similar. Um, however, the you know the big difference is that they now have Apple's new M1 chip, which is their Apple Silicon, aka ARM sixty four, and um, that brings incredible performance, wonderful battery life, and um, a new CPU architecture. So, yeah, and it's you know it's interesting. So you know a lot of people thought that you know after the uh... M1 chips, or you know, just the new the new Apple Silicon chips came out. And Apple could price down some of their products. Whoever thought that was crazy, because why would Apple waste money on making you yeah. happy? That's just increases not, the margin. Yeah, yeah. That, don't don't bother. I do think that it is inevitable that some of these products will slip downstream for more differentiation. So, if you look at the Mac, the 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 little Mac Pro, and you look at the MacBook Air, there's. Uh, kind of no difference between them except one has a fan right now yeah. and so I, I totally expect the mac touch bar Airs, well nobody no just <laughs> and i pre- think the pro has better battery life too it does but pretend the pretend that doesn't exist i think there's still going to be a place where the macbook airs fall in price i think they're going to get down eventually um and, and, and it just makes some sense for them to cash in on the new generation stuff so why not uh let's see what else do we have here so Let's talk about pricing real quick. Six ninety nine Mac Mini seems fine. Um, Hundred dollars less than before. Uh, all of the SKUs that they have here, all of the base model configurations are uh, eight gigs of RAM, right, and mm-hmm. two fifty six storage. With their unified memory, so there's no separate yeah. RAM and video RAM. Annoying. Though the integrated graphics, I think, have always used that approach. Yeah, They've I think that's how memory. it works. Yeah. And then uh, there is one slight difference in the core count. The lower end MacBook Air is using a binned uh, M1, so it's seven cores instead of eight cores. On the GPU side. Oh, okay, on the GPU side. Uh, so that's not a big deal. I don't think anybody's really going to notice. Um, I think there are some performance benchmarks, and it's like one-eighth slower. So, it, you know, it makes sense. Okay, cool. That is that is, that is how numbers work. Yeah, and the the CPUs it is the Apple says it's an eight core CPU, but it is four low power cores or efficiency cores and four performance cores. Yep. Oh. Um, yeah. So we've got 
$9.99 start price for MacBook Air. Allegedly, uh, there's an $8.99 SKU for education. I have no idea how to find that, and I don't care. And then, uh, since the announcement, a super secret SKU was found somewhere in a 128 gigabyte model configuration, and that's probably for bulk education sales. So again, nobody actually should care. Also, educators, do not buy that for any reason. But all of my work goes in Google Docs. Then you don't need a MacBook Air. Oh, okay. Yeah, just get the $100 Chromebooks. <laughs> right, because the kids are going to drop them anyway. Yeah. Um, and then the um, new MacBook Pro costs, what's the base price on that? Twelve ninety nine. Probably something yeah, like that. Sure. Yeah. Sounds I, plausible. I, I'm not sure. Apparently, yeah. I didn't write that down here because I did all of the other stuff and forgot about the new MacBook Pro. Um, people were concerned that it only has two two Thunderbolt ports and the old one had um, four, but they also simultaneously forgot that there was still a model with only two at one time. Yep. So this replaces that low end one. Was that called the Was that the MacBook Escape as we stole from some other yes, podcast? It was that one. So they added a touch bar to it. But kept the two ports. Right. And that, that was always a weird MacBook because it had a lower powered CPU from Intel. Right. It was a, I don't remember, like the, up, the upper, the 13 inch MacBook Pros, I think, had 28 watt chips mm-hmm. and the lower end one had like a 15 or something. Right. So it was kind of like a MacBook Air chip, maybe? Kind of. Yeah. yeah. Maybe a little bit more, but more like, yeah, more yeah. like an Air. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in, in, in summary, all of the pricing is kind of as you'd expect. There's no big price drop. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it was a fine launch. Uh, there were rumors beforehand that we would see a, a 16 inch MacBook pro, but that didn't happen. Yeah. So one like, um, pro oriented kind of thing is they only support one external display at a time. So it can, it can drive the 6k super fancy display from Apple, but it, can only just it you know only one of those i guess makes sense but it can also like only drive one one monitor right yeah Yeah. so just one so i think that's probably a holdout from the more ipad architecture of it Mm -hmm. um i would certainly expect that they expand that in the future because um for example you know at my work everyone has two displays right two displays yeah they plug in and they might have their laptop on the Mm -hmm. desk now most are running windows there but there are several mac users that have that kind of a setup as well yeah, I do wonder if that is, like you said, a holdover. Uh, I had been reading on the, either the Reddit or on the Hacker News, and somebody said that people have been trying to plug in their AMD uh, eGPUs, so an external enclosure GPU, and so the device, the the computers will see it, but there are no drivers for it yet. No. Oh, okay. um, so I wonder if, you know, when Apple says, like, hey, the eGPUs aren't supported right now, I wonder if that's because there just aren't any drivers right now and it's just easier to say no and nobody supports it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I am i wouldn't be surprised if that goes away, but yeah. that is, it's a, that's a pretty niche power user feature. Multiple displays, is that niche? Multiple displays, no, but like an extra graphics card. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. But maybe that's the way around it. So. Oh, sure. But I think Apple's going to have to do something with that with the Mac Pro. So I imagine we will we'll have to get some sort of discrete GPU support in yeah. the future. So I, I won't be surprised if that comes down the line, maybe with their second generation chip, when presumably they'd add the Pro Max. Well, I know that um, like big big data science stuff, they like to use the, the CUDA cores on the NVIDIA side, so I wonder what their interop plan is there, or if they're just going to ignore that entire market, which is totally fine, because nobody should support them. Yeah, so um, getting to some like performance and things, this thing is ridiculously fast it basically blows every computer out of the water with single core performance um and multi-core i think it's faster than most macs except for maybe the mac pro imac pro and top of the line imac from what i was seeing so i i put into the show notes here a geekbench browser website url link thing and if you click it you can see all of the m1 search results um but if you just you know, just go back to the the top level of the V5 um, scoring. You can see what all of the um, all of the computers out there are getting, and so you have to go like five pages down to even see the um, single core results of the M1 chips. Mm. So it's not like there aren't computers that are way better, but way better is really like it's five pages of way better. So all of the top scores are Ryzen chips on Linux. 
my guess is they're overclocked and maybe maybe not Ryzen's uh, pretty good. Maybe I, I it's not it, it doesn't say that it's overclocked. 3800 might not be. That might be just fine. And those are those are brand new chips and also I like how it's reporting as an iMac Pro 111. Yeah. <laughs> but like for you know, especially against Intel, these these are pretty much faster than almost any chip you'd buy. Yeah, I don't know if I see any Intel things on this page. You'd have to get to the Pro desktop class chips oh, to have here's one intel it's an intel core i7 9700kf i have no idea what that is uh at 3691 megahertz at, with four cores hmm. and this was submitted in 2019 which means it's fake and it's also running windows so nobody cares <laughs> yeah um so we shouldn't put our but stock when compared to other macs yeah so if you compare it to other macs that's great you shouldn't put all of your stock in geekbench benchmarks but if you look at like the MacBook Pro that we just talked about, the new one, um, and you look at the previous, you know, chip upgrade MacBook Pro from earlier in 2020, uh, you you come out with 26% difference in single core and 34% difference in multi core, and that's um, you know in the old days that would be two and a half generations worth of new Intel chips because you're getting about a a seven percent bump per generation but like that's compared to the to the good intel chips compared to what was in the old macbook air and things this thing is Very in some good. cases like <laughs> three times faster yeah. yeah i think the low power chips in this are almost the speed of the old intel chips right and and they're, it's making way less heat um according to everybody on the youtube um we shouldn't really compare this with the mac mini because apple intentionally crippled that thing for decades um but yeah otherwise it's it's just doing great uh tell me about this iphone benchmark that you did here brian i just ran this today now my phone did go to sleep so i don't know if that changed things i just like set up my desk and then forgot about it for 20 minutes but my geekbench scores from iphone 12 pro max um was 1591 for single core compared to like the the max here are around 1730 and the is 40 4200 whereas the m1 is around 7500 so like single core this is almost at the m1 i mean it makes sense they're pretty Mm -hmm. they're apple chips they're they have similar architecture a little bit different it looks like the multi-core performance is better on the m1 um they must have more cores there yeah i'm not quite sure well they they have the they have the four it's a higher wattage i think right and so they have the four um the four efficiency cores, like you said, and the and the high high power cores, they have the whole GPU package. The A14 has um, the low and high efficiency cores as well. Do they have the but same number though? I want to say they do. Like, like maybe it's four and four, and I don't know, could be different. But but I think the I think the difference is the M1 I think is like an 18 watt package, and on a phone that's mm-hmm. going to be less than that. So yeah. I think that's where that probably lands. Um, and so, you know, what I what I wrote down here was, let, let, let's just be real. We don't know how good these are until better ones come out. So, you know, if, if the M2 or whatever they call next year's chips are, you know, if they're only like 3% different, like if the 16-inch MacBook Pro is only a tad bit faster than this, maybe we kind of say like, oh, like maybe it wasn't that good. Uh, or what if these are the tip of the iceberg and the, and the, the, the big computers are like, you know, you're getting... Uh, I don't know, like if this is a 17, you're getting 3,000 single core score. Like that, that just, that's stupid. <laughs> but it's fun to think about. Yeah, these will be, these are the slowest uh, Apple Silicon Macs that Apple will ever make. So I know people have said that, but also I don't believe you. Well, right. So I guess, you know, as I mentioned, I didn't really watch the, the release, so I don't really know what I'm talking about. But I think I'm kind of curious about just how similar in performance all of these models are. Like looking at all of this, I think I would probably go for either the Air, or uh, I mean, the most likely thing I'm ever gonna, the most likely Mac out of these I'm ever gonna get is a Mac Mini. For sure. But like, it's amazing to me that there's that there's such a variety of prices for basically the exact same chip. Chip. Yeah. So you're not really paying for chip among these three products. You're really paying for form factor. Yeah, absolutely. But it's just confusing with the performance is all the same across what has historically been a budget line. Yeah. 
a absolutely neglected line like the <laughs> Mac Mini. Like not even it's not even budget. It's just like you know they haven't cared about it in well that forever. that one update a year or two ago when they actually updated it. Right. That's fair. That's fair. But other than that, yeah, it's been yeah. And then the Pro, which makes the money, right? The Pro is like that's what I use all the time. That's I expect that to be substantially higher performance, and it seems like higher performance in this case mostly means battery life, which. Right. You know. Yeah, the the Pro and the Air, there's like the Pro is a little heavier. It has a larger battery and it has a fan, but it almost seems like you don't really need that fan. I've heard that the fan when it comes on is extremely quiet. So, you know, the it's probably at very low speeds and it only and has one not... fan. Did the old models have two fans? I think the 13 inch always had one. OK, the 16, 15 has had, had two. two. Right. Makes sense. Though, actually, my 13 inch Pro might have have two fans, the 2018 model, but. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and then I, I also wrote here, you know, we can't know how good they are until we can run the war game on them. That's a joke. <laughs> Throw back. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, I... Um, hey, so who bought one of these? Oh, no, nobody, nobody's admitting that they did, so it must be me. <laughs> yeah, I bought, I bought a new 13-inch MacBook Pro, uh, 512 config, 16 gigs of RAM. So I figure, uh, you know, I like computers. I don't know if you know about that. That's true. Um, and I figure I can also just, you know, resell it for, you know, some amount of money. Like the Max hold, even even the Max that nobody likes still hold some value sometimes. Yeah. So like I'll eventually switch to a 16 inch or, you know, whatever the Pro or Pro is. Mm. Mm-hmm. My plan is to get a Mac Mini or an iMac once they are updated with the option for 32 gigs of RAM. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I'm thinking my, I have the LG 5K display, which is 27 inches plus a big old bezel. And my desk isn't that large. So I'll, I'm now thinking a smaller iMac, maybe a smaller iMac. If they're all the same chip, then that's probably fine. Yeah. And maybe the new iMacs will also have like less bezel as well. Mm-hmm. That, oh That'd my nice. God. I hope so. <laughs> that design <laughs> is can 10 you years imagine? old. Yeah, I can't imagine. If they add like the iPad Pro kind of sensibilities to the oh, iMac, yeah. that would be pretty cool. Like the Insta buy. The the iPad Pro that I have right here, let me see. I might be able to take it off of its power tether and hold it up for you. Yeah, but, it's like, beautiful. This, I that want, looks like a Mac. I want like one of these, basically. I'm just gonna take a little tiny screenshot and we can put it in the show notes because my picture is very tiny. Like are you sure that isn't the new iMac? Like did you just leak it? Yeah, I just I just leaked it. Let's, <laughs> yeah, gonna... I feel like the, the iMac can have thinner bezels all the way around and no no more chin. I don't think there's really a need to put anything there. I mean, if Apple's doing their own silicon, those M1 chips are probably a lot more efficient and they don't need to put in such a massive heat sink. Or a... The iMacs still have a space for a three and a half inch hard drive. I think they can get rid of that. I don't I don't know. So like what I've always held in contempt for the, the iMac line is like this, this weird trade off of hey, we're going to put mobile stuff into this computer because we don't actually want to cool it properly. Um, I hope what they don't do is compromise continuously again and still. Like, just put put the normal chips in it. It's okay. It's fine. Yeah, well, I think the, the design for the, the standard iMac just doesn't have the thermal headroom for the top-of-the-line Intel chips these days. They use so much more they power. Could have, they could have... Not the iMac Pro was redesigned for it, but they didn't ever bring that down to the consumer iMac. Yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, suspicion that there might not be an iMac Pro ever again, because why bother? Yeah, that's what I've heard, too. Why bother? I, I love <laughs> I love how blurry the picture is, too. Wow. <laughs> so I, I took a screenshot of my little thumbnail video inside of Skype, yeah. and then uploaded that to Twitter, and then took a screenshot of that, because I was like, that seems about right. Yeah, it does seem about right. And now I'm going to take a screenshot of this. <laughs> oh, no. And tweet it? Um, All the yeah. JPEGs. Yeah, uh, uh, I will do that later, at least. Uh, okay, well, so we've got one more thing, right, on Mac stuff. Is mm-hmm. that true? What What is the surprise? Is there a surprise? Not really. I guess, like, Apple has never really done a touchscreen thing, but they keep, they keep not doing touchscreen Macs. Um, which seems a little odd because they have lots of other touchscreen devices, so it's not like a supply chain problem necessarily. But they just... I haven't read this link that's in here. I don't know who posted it. But um, the it does seem like the like tack from Apple HQ is that nobody 
really wants to make a touchscreen Mac in the near future, which is really odd because I would love for my iPad to run Mac OS as evidenced by my conspiracy yeah, theory. Yeah, it would actually make the iPad useful. Right. Uh, I'll tell you two things about this topic. Um, I, I, I pulled an old the other day. Uh-huh. Uh, I was sitting sitting on the chair and I had the MacBook in my lap and I was coding or something and there was a button on the screen and I wanted to dismiss the pop-up. And so I touched the screen and it's like, <laughs> what am I doing? Why? I'm not I'm not my parents. What have I done? No, I feel you. Uh, and then the other thing that I would say about this is I think it's kind of expected that the first M1 chips don't don't get the new screen stuff. Yeah. Because like the whole point of this was to show like, hey, we didn't change anything except the chip and we win. Uh, I almost wonder if like the iMacs would be the better candidate for getting touchscreen stuff first because mm-hmm. they're a little bit bigger, but you don't have to worry about weight. Because I I think you know if you look at the MacBook screens now they're um like they're kind of thin so that might might ruin it a little bit. Some Ac- Apple executive was saying that um, Big Sur has more spaced out stuff for maybe presumably larger touch targets, but they they did they didn't do that for touch is what they were saying. So I that's mean that's what they say. Yeah, who knows? But I I, I when I get um when I get Big Sur in a few weeks here I will let you know what I think if it's true. Is that is that your XPS, Brandon? This is my XPS, which is a touchscreen. Okay, well, so take another screenshot of this, and you just say that you're leaking the touch version. <laughs> so do you do you think you, this this the the touchscreen portion of that computer? Do you think it's thicker than the equivalent MacBook Pro screen portion? It, it, it is definitely thicker than the equivalent. Yes. So I can I can't do it right now because I'm going to lose yeah. Mike. But I think overall, the thickness between the XPS and my MacBook Pro are very similar. But the screen mm-hmm. portion of this is about twice as thick as the screen portion of my MacBook. Yeah, so I, I think that might be one of the reasons they're they're a little hesitant to do it on the MacBooks. But I think on the on the Macs, like you're you're forced and you're obligated to buy a computer with the screen built in, even though you didn't have to. Right. Because it's but absurd. But imagine if they add a touchscreen and d- double the thickness. Then they can put a larger camera in than a 720p. <laughs> oh, on the yeah, that is true. That'd be pretty nice. I mean, what if they put the only the back? What if they put a rear camera, but only on the iMac? You can see that wall really well. That'd be pretty silly. Cool. Well, um, let's let's move on to our favorite segment, uh, our new Twitter follows. Uh, Brandon, you want to start? Yeah. Um, I followed a lot of people on Twitter, but I'm not going to tell you about any of them. Instead, I'm going to tell you about some YouTube videos. <laughs> and I know. Should we I... just make this section called shoutouts? Like sure. all the other podcasts probably call them. Sure. Why this not? Section. They're shoutouts now. They're shoutouts now. No, I like the idea of calling the section new Twitter followees still, but having new subsections. Like these are Brandon's YouTube highlights or something. Yeah. And now, and now, Brian, you have to go into your music mixer software thing and make like a little <laughs> a little bumper for this. Do 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 do. Yes. So, couple things. Um, why am I doing YouTube videos, not Twitter followers? Well, honestly, it's because all of my Twitter followers right now are like local politics people, and we've had enough of that. We've had enough things happening in the world. We don't need any more. We're done. We're done for the year. Gosh, knock on wood. So instead, I'm just going to post some tunes that I think are very, as the kids say, vibe worthy. Uh, so the first one is one I've referenced on Twitter and Slack and group chats and text messages galore. And it's a song by the band Krungbin uh, called Evan Finds the Third Room. And I love this song because it's just absolutely like it's funky and weird and chill and the lyrics are kind of total nonsense and all. And the band has said that it's inside jokes, which is all the better. So like, I'm like, I don't understand the inside jokes, but I love that somebody released a song that's just all inside jokes. And it's basically become a reaction gif in, in, in song form. So, you know, like I said, any, you know, anytime I say yes, then I just drop a link to that song because that's like 80% of the lyrics. It's just somebody saying yes in a very matter of fact kind of way. So there you go. That's, Evan Finds the Third Room by Krungbin. Next up, uh, oh yeah, I think Brian put this one here, but I'm going to adopt that as though it were my own. Uh, it's a song called Surf and Bird by the Trash Men. Surf and Bird, otherwise known as the song you play on Just Dance when you want to make everybody around you, um, infl- you just want to inflict pain on everybody around you. Um, so there you go. 
Fun fact, the trash men were out of Minnesota. I was just going to say local angle. They're from here. So uh, that is, I think, the only local angle song I have here. Why, yes, that is that is that is the case. So you got to give a Minnesota shout out. We also have. uh, Oh, yeah. After this, uh, we've got my personal favorite. I actually have this on vinyl. It is a cover of Wonderwall by a band called the Mike Flowers Pops that does a very like bossa nova sort of interpretation of uh, of Wonderwall. It's that's another one that it's really great to like inflict pain on your friends and, and neighbors um, because you know generally speaking people are just like oh yeah I don't know this is kind of a nice little jazzy something or other and then you hear you know the lead singer who I presume is Mike Flowers saying like backbeat the word on the street that the fire in your heart is out. It's like the worst thing, and I love it so much. So there you go. That's Mike Flowers Pops, Wonderwall. And then last but not least, because somebody said the names, uh, the name, the town name San Francisco, I put San Francisco by Foxygen, otherwise known as that song you've heard in every cafe ever, if you went to a cafe, back when that was a thing you could do. Um, so like, you know, a year ago. And that's another one that's kind of vibe-worthy and like just kind of matter-of-fact kind of lyrics, and it's just kind of chill tunes. So there you go. This has been Brandon's Chill Tunes in place of Twitter Follow Week Corner. I have had caffeine. <laughs> that might be true. You're, you're, moving, you're, you're standing during this this recording, but you're moving around a lot more than I'm, I'm used to seeing you move in the, the videos. Yeah. Caffeine. Yeah. All right. Um, I followed some people on Twitter. Um, I'll start off with... Uh, Sydney Buckner. Uh, she's a software engineer like most people I follow on Twitter these days. Um, she's a new uh, co-host on the Ladybug podcast. She oh. was on their most recent episode from this past week as we are recording this. So yeah, giving her a follow. Excited about that. Uh, she posts YouTube videos every Wednesday. I haven't really watched them, but I subscribe. So we'll see how it goes. Let's see. Next up is um, Sarah Soiden. I don't have no idea. Um, She's a UI designer and engineer. Has some um, good mix of CSS and more web design kind of tweets um, as well as other stuff. So I've I've seen her retweeted quite a bit on my feed over the last several months or years. So gave her a follow. And lastly, Neil Eggerwall, who is a creative coder. I've seen some... There was the... um, the, the big thing of his that I saw was animating URL transitions um, with some emoji. Um, so it you can progressively like push or replace the URL in the browser. Hmm. And so it's like it's, it's building the URL with you know, they put like a brick and a construction worker or a, or a hammer and a construction worker as it's adding and removing characters. Very silly. So that was kind of fun. Um, we talked about him at the Twin Cities CodePen meetup last weekend. Um, shout out to them. It's a great monthly meetup. Hang out on the Sunday at 11. Some cool Twin Cities peeps. I keep meaning to make it over to that. I have a personal call every Sunday at like nine. Otherwise, I'd, I'd be there. But um, that's always a really, really cool event. So awesome that it's keeping going. Yeah, I've been really enjoying that. So this, this uh, Neil came out of that one we talked about this weekend. So nice. Yeah. What about you, Ryan? Uh, I was just reading um, some of Sarah's tweets here um, because uh, some of the tweets are talking about tailwinds. And I believe that's yeah. one of my favorite things. Uh, and also one of the tweets uh, talks about deleting uh, her public Instagram account. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's fresh tweets 12 minutes yeah. ago. So uh, everybody on this call should delete their public Instagram. I will do it with you. But where will I put my bread pictures? On um, Brandon is bread dot com. Honestly. Yeah. You know what? I'll buy that. <laughs> Just post to Twitter fleets. It's no, fine. No, I don't have the Twitter app installed. That's right. That that's why you don't have any tweets this week. Okay. Well, on the uh, on my Twitter, uh, you know, I've done a bad thing. I've I've totally added these politic people to my Twitter. Um. So one of them is Nate Silver, and so I have a fascination with Nate Silver because I watch the um ABC Sunday News Show. I don't know what it's called. They all have the same name, just in different the word the three words are in different orders. Like it's News Today Week or Week Today News or news today week uh and so one of those features nate silver and he's this um like quant guy who looks at numbers and makes stuff up about it uh and he's just really funny about how he conducts himself and you know how he does his math and stuff Mm -hmm. um and so there was an election recently i don't know if you heard about this Mm -hmm. and so i was following nate silver a lot uh it might surprise you i have some opinions about nate silver we should talk about those sometime yeah yeah 
He's, he seems like an all right, you know, it, he kind of has a lot of the same things that a lot of people do, perhaps myself included, where like when you get too far into something, you kind of end up not really being intelligible to anybody else. And so he comes to these conclusions that are like for random people, it's like, wait, what? Like, yeah, how did yeah. you how did you arrive at that? Like, OK, fine. But it's like, you know, his his brain is just like in the matrix and that's just kind of which can be can be a good thing can lead to some strange results sometimes too and sometimes i feel like i might share an identity matrix with him i feel that uh okay well so my second twitter followee is uh none other than uh joe biden hey who's that guy never heard of him i i have no idea i see i uh until um a while ago approximately 2016 i didn't know that politicians had twitter accounts because that's ridiculous uh but apparently they all do now and um i thought i should follow a good one for a while yeah there you go uh and then and then finally back to developer news here i also follow sam skellikoff uh brandon and i were talking about sam the other day we i found one of these videos and so sam is a youtube guy i think he does other like i think he has a real job too but he does a lot of youtube stuff uh-huh. and um one of the videos he did like a podcast with somebody and he was complaining about GraphQL or maybe not complaining about it, complaining about rest. And I thought it was amusing, but I I really like what Sam does. Like he shows tailwinds and he shows um, like integrations with other frameworks and libraries. And it's, it's just really good. He does good work. Nice. It's awesome. All right. So what do you guys have coming up here? I'm just going to say I, I followed like all of, all of the people that you all mentioned. So I expect you all to listen to all of my (laughs) absurd tunes. Just just saying like, you know, well, so can you put all of your absurd tunes into like a playlist and then send me the playlist? Yeah. Would that require me logging into YouTube? It probably would. Wouldn't it? I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know if, if you want to really go down that music rabbit hole, Brandon, because once you get me starting to put in what I think is absurd tunes, it's going to be a whole new My brain world. will explode? Yeah. All right. Well, just listen to Evan Finds the Third Room for me, will you? That's a, that's a good one. Okay. That's the vibe-worthy one. <laughs> vibe-worthy one. But, but no, Brian asked a question. Sorry. What am I going to be up to in the next month? Uh, work. Work is probably going to be winding down over the next 30 days or so. Um, as everybody runs out of time, patience, money, brain space, nobody really wants to be working is especially you know as around the country you know we continue to Shut deal down. with the yeah c- continue to deal with the coronavirus pandemic so it's you know out here in minnesota of course you know it's worth mentioning that um we're not doing so hot with how we manage it you know it, as minnesotans like to you know you can look at wisconsin you can look at south dakota north dakota and say well we're doing better than those kids but are we but not but it's like uh, the same magnitude zone of worse yeah yeah, yeah we're, every uh, everybody is handling it very poorly i'm pretty sure that between cdc and mn leadership we have pretty much definitively said don't go anywhere don't do anything for thanksgiving yep. sit there with your turkey and eat it alone which honestly is going to be my plan because I'm I'm I bought a turkey and I'm going to defrost it over the next like four days. I don't I think it takes like forever to defrost a turkey. I've cleaned out. I accidentally slash on purpose cleaned out my fridge and am now prepared to defrost a turkey in it. And then I'm going to just be making lots of food over the next week. And that's going to be my like, quote unquote, Thanksgiving break out here. Yeah. Nice. How about you, Ryan? Uh, I am going to make pizzas for thanksgiving i think nice uh there's no real point in me cooking a whole turkey if i'm the only one who's gonna eat it uh so instead uh what my what my dad and i used to do on thanksgiving was make um homemade pizza so nice. i'm gonna do that very nice let's see i will be not seeing any people at least especially indoors maybe i'll wave from outside um Two people have said they have they're going to be cooking for Thanksgiving and they want to give me food. So I don't think I'll be cooking on Thanksgiving. Actually, I'll just be eating other people's food. <laughs> hey, then that's fine. Like if it's like a, a dr- drive by Thanksgiving, like that's almost just as good. Like you you get the food and you don't have to deal with the people. That's kind of better. Yeah, I'm just going to run over a baking dish to a friend of the show, Brennan Kuo, who lives like half a block from me. Um, and he says he'll give me some. He'll call me up when it's done and give me a whole plate of piping hot food later um there you go perfect i did pre-order a um pecan ice cream pie from milk jam creamery very nice right next to world street kitchen shout out to them delicious food but so it's gonna be like a a cream pecan pie kind of flavor ice cream but in like a 
pie crust. So I'll be giving giving some of that to who, people who give me food. Probably my mom and, and Brennan. But very nice. Let's see. I will also be anxiously waiting for the next video that Stuff Made Here posts to YouTube. Awesome channel. Uh, he makes some ridiculous inventions that are super like technical intricate he's he's got cnc machines and plasma cutters and cad modeling software and um he he has like this basketball hoop that moves itself and angles it for so it'll always catch a ball based on microsoft connect see he he built a baseball bat that that uses between one and four blank shells to launch an arm so it'll like launch a baseball 700 feet or something when you when you hit it which is like long further than the like furthest someone has done it in actual baseball with a real bat so some really cool invention maker stuff um that's been super fun to watch uh yeah otherwise where can we find you all brandon you can find me just about anywhere but mostly on brandon.mn no sorry my twitter is brandon underscore mn my website's brandon.mn, so if you swap out the underscore with a dot, it's the same thing. And if you start from the website, you can swap out the dot with an underscore and you'll get my Twitter. What? Um, and apparently I'm going to buy brandonisbread.com uh, so I can post my bread pictures somewhere that is not Instagram. Um, I don't know. Can you syndicate that stuff in any sort of reasonable fashion? Maybe yeah, not. Yeah, of course. I mean, as long as you have an Android phone, you can use the push notification button. But I, I mean, I do have an Android phone, but it's for it's for work. So. Oh, okay. Well, here, how about RSS? <laughs> My, okay, yeah, I guess I could do RSS. I guess yeah. I could do RSS. There you go. You could hook it up as a bot. You could just have a, like a, a thing just post to do Twitter whenever you update your feed. There you go. Perfect. That's probably what I'd do. All we, the bots. We, we, did it. we hacked it. Uh, but otherwise, I'll just be here in beautiful, historic Northeast Minneapolis listening to uh, podcasts and do, doing my thing. So how about you, Brian? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me. Um, also you can find me at JavaScript Minnesota on December 9th. Uh, let's see, what am I, where can you find me? Uh, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter, Random R, and of course on my website, randomrpresent.com. Uh, in the subsequent time here, I will be waiting my new MacBook Pro, but I will also be working on the New Year's cards that I will be, um, distributing in soon. Very nice. Nice. Got to get those dog pictures and got to get words written and a website made. And uh, man, it's a lot of work. I got to get my magnets ready to hang it in my fridge for six months. There you go. Uh, well, uh, you can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash PK62. Uh, if you want to discuss it, you can find us on Twitter, which is twitter.com slash thenexustv or our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. And if you like what we're doing here at the network, uh, swing on over to patreon.com slash thenexustv. Uh, yeah, I think that's our show. So until next time, have a good one. Have a good one. Bye. Brian, you got to say it. Have a good one, Brian. No, nope, you don't get it no? this time. No. Ah. Uh, Wait, I should say, have a great one. <laughs> it's too, it's too. too. May, may your days be acceptable. Uh, Bill, Billy Chan. He always used to tell everybody, have a bad day when everybody left for class. Good old Billy Chan. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.